Social security could bankrupt the country. Another reason why gold is important, because they're going to need something to sell to, to help offset the lack of taxes coming in. I think the bottom for gold, you know, you're going to see 23 to 2500 stabilization. I think you're going to see that for a very long time, but you're going to see massive spikes. I think we could run three, four, five thousand dollars over the next years. What are the uh, biggest risks and challenges facing our economy that could push safe haven assets up to new all-time highs never before seen? And what does this mean for investors invested in the uh, precious metals markets? We'll talk about this issue with Morgan Lekstrom. He is the president of Next Gold, a very interesting project based in Ontario. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. It's pretty exciting times these days. What's great about your project is that you've got a-list roster of executives who have been working at the most successful mining companies in the world. We'll talk about that in just a bit. It's a relatively new company, uh, but the roster that you have is um, is uh, t top tier. Let's talk about gold. Uh, gold is an asset that has defied gravity all year. Every single time I talk to somebody every single week about gold, it's just reached new all-time highs. Now, today I'm talking to you on the 28th of September. It's at 2681. So a bit of a pullback from a couple of days ago when it reached its then new all-time high. We're inching towards 2700. Are we going to see 3000 by the end of the year? Do you think? Nobody knows for sure, but let's just get how you feel. Absolutely. I mean, look at the macro situation and the micro events within the macro situation. You've got BRICS happening right now saying they're going to rehedge to gold at least 40% of their currency. You've got China buying gold up faster than it's ever bought it ever. And the great thing is they don't tell you about it. So you don't know how much they're buying, but 26 something gold, 2670 gold should be a pretty clear indicator of why we need gold in our backyard and we need it in Canada and we need it built and manufactured and put together in Canada. And I say manufactured, I don't mean the gold itself. I mean all the manufacturing to support the mines. Okay. You you mentioned to me offline that they're stealing the gold. What do you mean by that? I mean, look, look, look at the rest of the world. Everywhere else is producing. China is all over Africa right now. I worked in Africa for years and all you see is, is China coming in and starting to mine the easy to mine gold projects they don't have the same restrictions as we do and you know esg they they're not focused on they're literally focused on getting the gold out of the ground and i'm not i'm not condoning that what i'm saying is we need to speed up how we get gold out of the ground in canada in the us in the north american market that's why for us our project is so key we're 16 months away from building it look you can't sustain an economy when everyone else is hedging to gold when you don't produce it yourself and you don't buy it yourself. Why do you think the governments aren't um, stockpiling more gold right now? I mean, the central banks have been buying, uh, but uh, it doesn't seem like the treasuries are adding more gold to their to their uh, balances as they used look, to. Look, if I if I were to make an assumptive or make a presumption here, mm -hmm. yeah. I would assume that if the treasuries and the banks started buying swaths of gold, they would indicate and signal to the market that the fiat was failing. So it's a fine balance for them. They have to quietly do it, but they're going to need to get loud soon. And when they do, mark my words, they're going to try to buy every bit they can. And they're going to look in the jurisdictions that they own going, where can I buy gold and how do I control that supply chain? So, I mean, you're seeing that across the world but what i what i really do think here is you're going to see that flip happen you're starting to see the the inflationary and deflationary cycles look more sinusoidal they're compressing in time horizon which means that they're going to start going more up and down up and down up and down instead of long prolonged inflation and long prolonged deflation cycles interest rates as we know them those cycles are shortening you just saw it it's been, what, a year of interest rate rising, and now interest rates are dropping at a rapid rate. That time horizon is changing. The only way out is rehedging to gold or buying more gold. So are you are you suggesting that uh, uh, there's going to be more buying of gold from, from central banks and authorities? I, if it was me guessing, yes, I would guess that you have bricks trying to buy all the gold up right now at 40 you know, to rehedge 40% of the, their, what they consider the world's currency. I think you're going to see the U.S., you're going to see maybe Canada, some of these other nations, Switzerland, 
all start to really restock on that, which will drive the price through the roof. You know, one of the criticisms that I've gotten about gold is that it was supposed to be money. People talk about it being used as money. It's, you know, one of the oldest forms of money, yet it's not really when you think about it, is it? I mean, I can't, I don't, I don't actually use it as a medium of exchange. And so if you consider it that way, um, when can we expect, or do you expect some period of time in which gold can be transferred as a medium of exchange and be used as actual money in our day-to-day -day transactions? You know, David, that's interesting. You, you, you say that as a medium of exchange up until what the eighties and sometimes in the nineties, it was a medium of exchange. It was just fractionalized into what we call the dollar. Right. So when you think about that, when you rehedge, it is actually a medium of exchange. We just don't trade coins anymore. The bank owns it and then they issue dollars in relative value to that. So if you think about it like this, gold has always been a medium of exchange. There's a U.S. dollar value to it. You can take your gold and switch it in for U.S. dollars. So there is a little bit of an internal hedge there. There's a there's a way to do it. And when the banks rehedge, again, when they buy more gold, the amount of treasuries they issue, all that is about to be rehedged to it. Do I expect us to be trading in silver coins? No, we have digital currency now. We have, you know, we have dollars. We have many different ways to trade this, but it will be backed by gold. And that is the key component. So you are still trading gold. We know gold is used as a safe haven asset. It hedges against volatility, among other things. However, there's been a few instances in the past when the uh, gold itself was confiscated by the government. One of the most notable instances is in 1933 when Roosevelt seized gold bullion and forced people to liquidate at below market price. Now, immediately after this confiscation, uh, the government set a new official rate for gold uh, that was much higher. It's part of the Gold Reserve Act of 1934. This was during the Great Depression. There's all sorts of theories as to why they've done this and why they needed gold. Perhaps they needed to pay off their debt. Can you see something similar happening in the next financial crisis? Oh, man, I, I don't think you could do that again. We are too far advanced technologically. You would completely, in my opinion, if they did something like that, you completely depress the valuations because digital currencies exist, because things like Bitcoin exist. You'll see those become a bit of a safe haven. What I can see is the other way, which you are seeing with ETFs and all that. They're not only buying gold. They're buying swaths of Bitcoin because they're going to control that supply. So you have the, the technology stack now where you have big funds, BlackRock, not only buying gold, but buying the Bitcoins of the world. Those things are going to be used as hedges. And when I say hedges, I mean, they're going to be used as trading mechanisms. Do I think the government is going to go and confiscate all the gold? If they did that, it would erupt the economy. It would be complete, utter disaster. That is why... Personally owning gold, I own gold, you know, co companies are starting to buy it. Again, BlackRock, Goldman, all these people are starting to purchase swaths of gold. There's a reason for it. Do you hold your gold until basically you die? Because that's one uh, That's one philosophy I've heard. The mm -hmm. other philosophy is just to buy in and out when the price is right. It's kind of like what central banks do, right? There's a spectrum of people who day trade commodity futures, and then on the other end, there's people who hold it, and it, it's um, it's a family heirloom. It's not uh, it's not something to be traded. Where do you lie on the spectrum? <laughs> I think that's more like a gold Rolex, <laughs> and uh, yeah. and I don't own one, so don't worry, I'm not. I don't have one to trade with. But you know what? It's a medium again. It's a medium of exchange, so you can walk into your bullion dealer. You could have bought it at twelve hundred. Now you're offing it at what above spot the spot probably around 3000 2800 us um you've made a good profit margin so yeah it's sitting there as a medium of exchange i think it's one of those things you just stack you keep there and when you need it or when the us dollar or another dollar centralized currency isn't doing well you still have it as a medium so no like i've got stacks of silver at home silver coins and I've got stacks of gold, not as much clearly because <laughs> there's a price difference. But I, I think you can use it in both ways. You can pass it down or you can keep it and uh, sell it when you need to. We saw a period in which high inflation debased many currencies around the world. Now, however, the inflation rate has come down, meaning the rate of change of prices has come down, whereas before prices had increased by 9% a year in the U.S. Now it's only growing by about 2.5%. Uh, the question is whether or not this is still an environment that is conducive for 
gold price. Now, we know that gold has historically done very well when there's very high inflation. Gold has done very well when there's deflation. In both scenarios, we need to protect our fiat currency. But when inflation is just relatively low, chugging, chugging along, do we still need something like a precious metal? You got to remember that inflation measurements are decided by people, right? What what they decide the CPA, CPI numbers are based on and inflationary numbers are decided on, oh, well, we're going to put energy and maybe some food in there, but we're not going to put, you know, the daily cost of living, the transportation. There are so many issues with a calculation that is solely decided by people going, yeah, it's about 2% when it's probably more like 6 You can feel it when you go to the grocery store. You and I live in the same city. You know this. You go to the store, you buy a block of cheese, and you're like, wait, we're only at 2% inflation. Why did it go up 8% over the past three months? Like, this doesn't make sense. And you you not only have that environment where credit is more expensive right now, because that truly is, you know, you can't run inflation at 2% when credit, lines of credit for companies to operate on are sitting at 6 to 8%. They have to pass that down to the consumer at some point. These aren't free, mo- this isn't free money. So yeah, I think that the numbers that we see are not actually correct. And I'm not going to go down a conspiracy mm-hmm. rabbit hole there. Sure. But I do think that they're placating the masses to an extent and trying to use psychology to tame it down. But again, you get to this point, yeah, those cycles are compressing. Those inflationary, deflationary cycles are compressing in time horizon, which means that Gold is becoming more and more predominant to hold because you're going to see wicked ups and almost no downs because, again, you don't have the five or 10 years of slow inflation, low interest rates. You're going to have a year or two, a year. What's the absolute bottom for gold for you? Because in the past, okay, here's one theory. In the past, the all-in sustaining cost for a large miner was around, what, $1,000, $1,100 on average. And so below that, it would make sense that production would stop. And that would be the equilibrium price. Um, I, I guess that makes sense in economic theory because below the production price, no one would produce any more gold, and so there would be a shortage. Now, what would the lowest price be in theory for you? Look, I, I think again, given the macro situation, macroeconomic situation, and destabilization that's going on in the in the currency world, which happens every 120 ish years, we keep forgetting this that there are cycles. And they're called debt cycles, debt bubbles. And you should listen to Frank Juster talk. He's, he's one of our main backers, but he uh, he definitely has a lot of knowledge on this. I think the bottom for gold, you know, you're going to see 23 to 2,500 stabilization. I think you're going to see that for a very long time, but you're going to see massive spikes. I think we could run three, four, five thousand dollars $5,000 over the next years. And then it may pull back a bit, but to your point on sustaining costs, your eleven, twelve hundred dollars doesn't mean that's your break even. You still have inflationary, you have escalation, you have capex that you still have to spend on your projects. You have opex increases every year. Like if you're an eleven hundred dollars sustaining, your break even is probably thirteen because you still need to make money to advance projects, right? You still need to have capital there. It's just like buying a house. You buy a house and in twenty years you replace a roof. You need to be saving for that. That's a cost of ownership similar to a mine, similar to any business. What is great about the gold mining business, which everyone forgets, this is a business. If you are producing gold at $1,100 and it's at $2,600 and your payback's less than two years, whew, that's a good business model. <laughs> uh, I uh, spoke to Peter Groskoff not too long ago, former CEO of Spot, and he, uh, he and I talked about uh, this chart among others. Total deficits, primary deficits as a percentage of GDP and net interest outlays. This is from the CBO, the Congressional Budget Office in the U.S. Um, they're a nonpartisan uh, group that uh, analyzes debt trends and makes forecasts. This is their projection. Going into 2050, both the deficit and on another chart, the debt to GDP levels will be increasing. Net interest outlays so just payments on the interest, which is, you know, interest on their debt, that's expected to increase dramatically if nothing changes. Primary deficit is staying relatively uh, stable. However, we're just going to see a lot more deficit and spending from the government just to pay back their debt. What does this mean for not just gold, but the economy? Well, what you're missing in this chart is if you look historically, let's say from 2020, from that spike back to 1950, there are, again, spikes up, spikes down. 
yeah. to project this out in a, in a linear manner like it is, is negating the massive ups and the massive downs you're going to see, which are your bull and bear markets. Or in this case, your massive amount of debt starting to rise and the interest payments. I don't think it's as linear as that. I think it's you're going to see a massive spike up and then you might see a slight pullback and another massive spike up until the deficits and the interest rates are easily mergeable. You're not you're not going to have a time where it's just linear like this. I, I get it. They do it for ease of use or yeah. ease of viewing. I don't I don't think it's as as simple as this. I think there are way too many large scale events. COVID being look at 2020, 2021. That was a huge spike. You are going to have other massive events. You have 8.5 billion people ish on the planet and you have egos everywhere between all the governments. Nothing's linear anymore. It's unpredictable. So in that sense, yeah, the U.S. is going to keep printing. Everyone's going to keep trying to get social welfare. And you're going to get to a point where the system breaks and it breaks big. A, when they can't pay the debt. B, when people no longer get checks because they can't pay the debt. And C, when taxes raise so high that the middle class no longer is there. One of the biggest problems facing our economy actually is like you said, pointed out social security payments. And that's because our population is aging. The fertility rate has been declining. Uh, several economists on my show are projecting a fertility rate uh, projection of below two, which is which is to say the population will decline. If every woman is having fewer than two babies, that means we're not replacing the dying population. And so when that happens, the population gets older, we shrink our population, the government needs to pay more in social security, perhaps, um, and the economy becomes less productive, the economy shrinks, right? Uh, lower growth overall could be a result. Uh, what does this mean for investors? How do they need to prioritize themselves? Yeah, interesting point. Look at Japan. I mean, projected to actually be in a declining population over the next 15 to 50 years, which, you know, when you and I talk about 50 years, we're like, oh, my God, that's a long time. When you look at on the scale of society, that's a blip. If you have a declining population in 50 years, that's a problem. This is this is the fundamentals of immigration, to be honest. You 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 can't if you look at a glass that's round like this and it tapers down to its stem the population growth or the population of reproduction rate that's reproducing is the stem. The top side would be your boomer generation, the older generation that needs social security. So you need to at least even that out, if not make it a more of a bottom, let's say like a, like a uh, big glass yeah. <laughs> that's bad on the bottom. We need it bigger on the bottom, like a pyramid. So that yeah. the, the money funneling up to the top <clears throat> is there. You're absolutely right. Social security could bankrupt the country. Another reason why gold is important because they're going to need something to sell to, to help offset the lack of taxes coming in and lack of, of CPP type payments coming in or superannuation in Australia. The big thing for me is these CPP and these big funds that pay need to be investing more in Canada. Look at the Australian system, their superannuation fund put something like 40 or 50% into commodities. Don't quote that number. This is just my memory. But you have the Canadian pension plans investing in almost everything outside of Canada. Like wild, wild volatility when you do that. You can't control the economy. You can't. So you get to a point where immigration becomes <clears throat> one of your leading issues and it has to be intelligent immigration because you need to pay taxes and you want higher income to pay those taxes because you pay more. So you either have one, one way of doing it. You either bring in more people that pay less taxes to accommodate, or you bring in less people that earn more money to pay more taxes. And in the end, no matter what, you need to backfill this population gap that on a two to one ratio, I would argue that in this economy, you need three for two. You should be having three family members for the two that exist because you can't backfill the generations right now. We've already been through a generational cycle where not enough kids have been had. We're probably, you know, I'm 39 years old. I have a son and I'm looking like, okay, how, uh, <laughs> how's he going to support me in the future? <laughs> yeah. There's only one of them. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> 
I'm 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 sure he's gonna do just as well as his dad. Uh, uh -huh. but let let's talk about um how the gold price has historically done versus stock markets. I have here a gold to a uh, Dow to gold ratio over the last hundred years or so, mm -hmm. and in the past when it spiked, the Dow to gold ratio meaning uh the price of stocks have elevated greatly beyond um the growth rate of gold. That was during two thousand. Yeah. And then now we're about uh, at 19, uh, which is slightly above, I would say, a historical average. Now, at uh, at its peak, when gold peaked in 1980, uh, it was near one. So down to gold ratio was near 1.4. Now, yeah. if you assume, by the way, I'm not saying it will, but uh, I know that um, Pierre Lasson has made this point several times. But if you take just the Dow Jones today, it's at 42,000, right? So in a hypothetical situation where we return to 1980, where we get a Dow to gold ratio of nearly one, we're looking at $30,000, $35,000 on the price of gold, which is 10x what we're currently, currently seeing. Hypothetically, I'm not saying it's going to happen next year, and people have talked about a doomsday scenario needed for this, but what would need to happen uh, for gold to retest a Dow, a, a Dow to gold ratio of one or 1. 1.4. Look, I mean, the technological advances that have been made over the past 20, 30, 40 years have really offset that in an extent. Again, I go back to there's such large changes on the currency side of things in the world that I do think you're going to see that narrow, that margin narrow. And I think it's going to be a Dow pullback and it's going to be a gold going up. So you're going to see the tech stocks, you're going to see all those major indice stocks. I think they're going to pull back. They're at all time highs and what I call like, you know, fake currency. You have nothing hedged to. Well, we're hedged to the treasury. Okay. No, you're hedged to belief that people believe that the US dollar is worth what it is. People automatically for thousands of years believe gold is what it is. It has been proven. It's a tried, tested, and true asset. Every time in history that we go to a fiat style currency or a currency that is de hedged or de decoupled, it eventually gets overprinted. I mean, there's <laughs> there's so many times in history this has happened. The Spaniards has happened to, the Greeks has happened to. They overspend, they leverage too high, and it has to get pulled back. So I think you're going to see gold run into that Dow Jones kind of model where it's going way up, and you're going to see some of the stocks pull back, which means for the gold equities, hold on to your butts. I'm going to uh, move on to the gold equities in just a minute, but finishing off on the gold price, this is from the In Gold We Trust report. Uh, this comes out every year. Uh, Ronald Sturfler is involved. I have him on all the time. Uh, great guest. Anyway, the stock-to-flow ratio is the most significant reason for gold's monetary importance. And I'd like to ask a miner about this. It says here, the gold supply curve only changes marginally. Scrap supply can be volatile while mine production is highly inelastic. If one compares this to the supply curve of paper currency, this is one of gold's major advantages. Governments can print currency at will. There is no difference between the digital cost of printing a 100 euros note to a 10 euro note. There is, however, a substantial difference between producing 100 ounces or 10 ounces of gold. This former takes exactly 10 times the effort. First of all, is this true? And second, can this change? Meaning, could mines where miners like yourself in the future discover some way to greatly increase the supply curve and mass produce gold to such an extent that this would no longer be applicable well yeah look i mean it's it's starting to happen you're, again i go back to the point of you're seeing tons of mines being built in africa and in these volatile jurisdictions you're seeing a lot of chinese influence there come in and what that's going to do is that's going to create a, a nice supply chain for them which is going to deprive the world of the supply chain of gold from that area that inelastic, inelasticity between gold and actually printing money is why gold is going to run, is because you have a finite amount of it. It's something that is finite in nature because it takes human capital to build and to maintain. Whereas turning on a printing press and printing dollars and then adding some numbers to a screen is so insanely cheap, which think about it. What is that piece of paper worth? Well, it's worth the numbers printed on it because we say it is. That gold bar you can hold in your hand and it's heavy and you can trade it and you can sell it and people want it. 
currencies change. I think that the amount of gold being produced, you're right doesn't change what you're seeing this in the mid tiers and in the majors. They're going from looking for the next million, half million ounce deposit to the next 250,000 ounce deposit to us at Beaver Creek. And people are saying, we're looking for the next 100,000 ounce per year production potential deposit. And I'm going, okay, well, wait, wait, do I have a story at next gold for you? But that being said, that is the sign of the times. The big deposits are slowly being depleted, which means that the smaller deposits, they're going to need more of them. They're going to need them in safe jurisdictions. And they're going to want to be in, in an area that they can get the right labor to have it. So again, back to inelasticity, it has to do with a lot with human capital, has to do a lot with jurisdiction, permitting timelines. Do I think you could get a 10, 10 to 1 ratio out of gold to currency? I think you're going to get a stronger leverage than that in the near future. Uh, okay, let's talk about gold miners now. Warren Buffett famously doesn't like owning gold, the metal. However, in 2020, for a brief couple of quarters, he bought Barrick. Uh, he bought it where his company, Barrickshire Hathaway, bought it, not because he all of a sudden had a change of heart about gold, but because Barrick at the time was producing steady cash flow. It was just fundamentally a very good company from just a value investor's perspective. How are we going to convince the rest of the hedge fund industry that perhaps, you know, the GDX index comprising of the biggest miners in the world, the gold miners in the world, are all investment grade material? I don't think you have to convince them. I think it'll automatically happen. I know that sounds cliche, like, hey, if you build it, they will come. I really think the price of gold running like it is, you're starting to see the black rocks of the world go, oh, we need to start buying gold. You know, they're starting to do this. Now, the investment street, there is a disconnect. There's a disconnect in the price of gold to the equities, which makes it an amazing time as, as a personal investor. I get to go and invest in equities that are not even closely representative to the actual net present value of the company. They don't trade near what the tech stocks are, which means if you think about this, the tech stocks are overvalued. So you're buying into a tech stock like, let's say, Apple. That's why Berkshire off half their position in Apple, because it's not gonna go from three trillion to six or 10. It, I believe the value curve in those larger stocks have been capped. You have production values in gold that are, production rates in gold that are happening in these, in these equities and in these large companies, gold rising. Think about it on a pure, utter business sense. They are producing insane cash flows, insane, most like, in most cases, way better than real estate. Most cases, better than most businesses. Yet, because we're gold miners, we're capped. That is changing. People are starting to flock back into this because they realize that, oh my goodness, there is a value depravity there. And that's where you make a lot of money. And I think that's gonna, you're gonna see that across the Berkshires. You're gonna see that across a lot of these larger equity plays, hedge funds. They're all gonna start coming in here, which they're starting to. Well, how do you explain to the average uh, generalist investor that there is still value in the gold miners, if there is? Uh, because I ask this because if you take a look at how the stock markets have performed overall, the tech stocks have been leading the way. The S&P 500 is up at least 25%. And uh, all markets, including gold, have done very well. Why would I take speculative positions in junior miners? We'll talk about juniors in just a bit when I can get very good yield on blue chip tech stocks, right? that there, there, there's, um, it, it's a difficult sell in this particular environment. How would you answer that? I, I would uh, actually rebuttal back saying in the last environment, it was a difficult sell. As interest rates decrease, risk tolerance increases because money becomes cheaper. And that means you can either earn a 5% dividend or have the chance at 100x or a 10x or a 20x. So it depends on your risk threshold and comfort. When money gets cheaper, Risk thresholds change. And people say, well, there's no risk threshold for gold in, in the industry. I would argue that completely. The crypto industry, high risk, sometimes high reward, most times not. The miners that have something real, that have a real asset, that are have real teams. And what I mean by that is have talented people that can actually advance the company. Those are much less risk to increase in value than a fire shot across an exploration property. Yes, you're gambling. You may have something there and you may go up. But when you look at where gold's at 
and the cash flow models that these companies are starting to project, gold gold miners will start to pay dividends very shortly, big ones. And you're going to see that switch. If, if you had a, I'll ask you, if you had a company, doesn't matter what it is. Sure. Hey, hey David, we're going to pay you a 17% dividend or a 10, 12% dividend. Would you invest in that? Would you care what they're producing? Okay. I, I see where you're going with this. I would kind of care only if their stock doesn't go down dramatically and that wipes out the 17%. But yeah, assuming it doesn't go down and wipe out 99% of equity value because they're doing something stupid, which I know you guys aren't, then yeah, I, I, of course. Of course, I would be very happy with it. Are you saying we're going to get 17%, 19% dividends soon in the gold mining stock Look, sector? I, think, I don't think it's unreasonable to assume gold keeps going up and the cash flows keep going up. One of two things is going to happen. One- Gold miners, I do believe, are going to start paying dividends. Ideally, the, the best case for a junior miner, and especially a junior miner like us, is stop, completely stop your uh, your dilution and start paying back your shareholders money, right? And that's through two, two types of methods. One, stock price increase. Two, dividends in the future. I do think you're going to see, you're going to see share buybacks. You're going to see dividends increase in value because, look, if you're cash flowing that much, then only next thing companies will need to do is be acquiring other companies because they're going to need more production. Gold at twenty six hundred dollars, all in sustaining at eleven or twelve, you have a double. Come on, that's that's an insane margin. So the dividends prospect is attractive, <coughs> no doubt about that. Especially in a lower yield environment, we're always looking for ways to beat uh, the interest rate because I could have bought a money market fund for 5% in the future. It could only be 2%. So how do I beat that? Dividend stocks, definitely a great play. However, as an investor, wouldn't you want the Barrick or the Newmonts of the world to put that money to expanding your assets, more M&A, more aggressive growth than just pay me a dividend? I mean, thank you for the dividend, but I want you to grow, right? Uh -huh. Well, 100%. Like you can't continually pay a dividend unless you grow. Here's, here's the thing. Why Apple does so well is because they continually innovate and they come out with new products that people buy. So it, again, it's the money, it's the world. It just transfers around, right? Like you're transferring your paycheck, which is after tax to Apple. In the gold space, you continually have to be producing it. So as production goes down, price goes up. You actually see a, a kind of a, a directly proportional or an inversely proportional, sorry, curve here where if production goes down around the world, the price is going way up. You can still pay those dividends. But there will be a fulcrum. There will be a change when that is not true. So you're right. You need to be investing, but don't go after you know ten billion dollar capexes as, as mid tiers. You go after bite sized chunks and you start paying dividends. I like small, bite sized financeable chunk projects because they can cash flow exceptionally well. Don't discount the companies that cash flow three, four, five hundred million a year to the ones that are bigger. Bigger has overhead. Bigger has a lot of guidance they have to follow in the sense that they must expand. They must do this. Where smaller, you can go after these 100,000 ounce per year producer projects. Yeah. And bolt those together, it's much easier to find those than to find the big ones. Why is it that the seniors aren't aggressively engaged in M&A to the extent that maybe they were in 20, um, 2011? Well, they're probably still pulling out of that cycle of when they went out and bought a bunch of stuff and cold tanked. Okay. <laughs> because well, and, and I don't mean it as in tanked, I mean as in the sentiment sure. of the industry, they were still producing. So naturally a lot of these companies went and overpaid for their products. Like you see, you've seen that across the industry. Huge buyouts and then huge capexes. Again, I, I think you're gonna see, and you've seen it already with the higher level mid tiers and even the majors come in to buy projects in Canada. You saw it with the buyout of a Cisco mining. Wait, a minute. are we, are are you are you saying uh, that in the future we're going to see cycles in which we have M and A when gold is low and not high because people have learned the lesson they're not going to overpay for projects and so the capex budget, their M and A budget is going to be deployed when we have a downturn in the market. Not wouldn't, now, for example. Wouldn't that be nice? But that's not how it works because you get fear fear of missing out mm -hmm. and you. Big. The, here's the thing. You get deposits and projects that are advanced that will produce, let's say, over 100,000 ounces a year. They will get bought. So the majors will start and they've started to be scared that they won't be able to be the ones buying them. Now they're going to have to buy a mid-tier, which is a lot more expensive an endeavor. 
because the rating's much higher. So yes, they will buy. You know, one thing a company like Freeport, I used to work for Freeport in Indonesia, and one thing Freeport was exceptionally good at is buying when they're down to build for when they're up. That was the model. That doesn't happen anymore because you don't have enough time to do that. Like I said, the cycles compress so much that you just got to buy. And then you ride the down and you build up. And it just happens. You're, you're seeing that over and over. Gold is going up. That means that eventually there will be massive consolidation. You've started to see it already. Okay, so not all gold miners are made equal, like you said, especially in the junior space management team. I've heard this over and over again from people that I know as well, not just you um, saying it, but people have told me the management team is probably the most important factor in deciding whether or not to invest in a junior. So tell us about your management team and the board of directors that you have and the experiences that they've accumulated over their careers. Well, you mentioned Barrick Gold and Berkshire Hathaway investing. We have the chairman of our board is the ex-president of Barrick Gold. He's the ex-CEO of De Beers, which is a giant diamond company of De Beers Canada. He is one of the most notable mind builders in Canadian history. That's Jim Gowans is his name. He is leading this company. He sits on the board of tech. To get someone of this caliber, you need two things. You need a great management team that can execute, and you need a project that is executable and buildable. You have Jeremy Wyeth as CEO. As you mentioned before, I'm the president. Jeremy and I split that role very nicely. Jeremy is a through and through mind builder. He is someone that his last mine, he built for De Beers in Canada. Again, I'm not gonna sit here and wave, uh, arm wave and tell people, we've got the greatest team in the world, because I do believe that. But I'm gonna tell you, we have the team that can execute and get the job done. And that is the key component missing in a lot of this space. When you put management teams together from all different sides of the industry that have all different experiences, who's who's executing? Who's running the project? You need a vertical stack, a hierarchy of people that have experience throughout the entire management team and the board. You have Jim Gowans, you have Jeremy Wyeth on the board, you have myself, I built mines and been a part of mine builds around the world and other industries as well. You have people like Andy Bowering, on our board who's built mining companies and sold them to help guide us. You have people like Rob McLeod, exceptional geologist, helps guide the geology on the board. You have people like Michelle Ashby and Margot Naughty on the finance side. And another key person that I never skip over is Paul McRae. He was the personal um, technical advisor to Lucas Lundin, helped them understand their entire pipeline. Paul McRae is on our board. So you have that on the board. Then you have myself, you have Jeremy Wyeth as CEO, you have Oren Baranowski as CFO. And I, you know, everyone says, well, the CFO, I can tell you right now, there's not many CFOs I've worked with in the world that have project operations and builder experience. Oren has that and finance. Rachel Pinot has done probably more IBAs, which is impact benefit agreements in Canada. You need that with First Nations than anyone else. She has done over 12 of them. Again, you have a team that's curated to build a mining company. And in this environment, with the right asset that we have in Goliath, you have 3 million ounces there and it's buildable. It's permitted on the federal level and it's finalizing the provincial permits. We're driving very quickly to building Canada's next gold mine. There must be something about the deposits that you have that have attracted all these talented people and brought them together. What is it about next gold that stands out in terms of the geology, the deposit that you currently own? Well, I said it's 3 million ounces. We've only explored about 10% of the land that we own that is on that strike. And what strike means is the entire length that you see is mineralized. So well, let's, have, let's back up here. So North, Northern Ontario, that's where you're located? Northwestern Ontario, Dryden, which is a, a community. We're 15 kilometers from a community. Okay. We have power, we have running, we have water, we have we have um, roads through our property. We have all the makings, the hallmarks of an easy to build mine. That's one aspect of why they're here. Two, the expandability. There's significant upside potential in this district. Three, it's buildable. It's buildable, it's financeable, but it's also a fairly simple project when you talk about two open pits and a plant, a processing facility. It's not overly complex. So you have all those and then you pull back to the 30,000 foot view and you go, wait, there's no one else within 250 kilometers of us when we're built that will have a process plan. So when you start thinking generational asset, 
Well, there's going to be, a, there's a lot of discoveries going around us. There's a lot of companies building around us of building up their asset, building up their gold property. They're going to need to put that somewhere. So we will be that as well as an expandable district. So there's a lot of avenues with Next Gold that are not only expansion on our current asset, but we're going to take this team and we're going to build a pipeline of buildable gold assets in North America to use this team to grow this company very quick. Frank Juster is our main backer. It's his buy build strategy and it's worked over and over and over in these cycles. Yeah. What, what is Frank's involvement here as a backer? Frank's a over 10% shareholder. Um, I work out of Frank's office, work with him very closely. You know, the vision that that man has and the steadfast, I would say, investment that he puts in this space when these cycles happen, he generally calls the equity cycles about a year ahead of time. He's been ex very good at this. He builds these companies. He puts assets together with the right teams and these companies take off. Endeavor Gold, you have Gold Corp, you have Leia Gold, you have Eris. You have companies that Eris alone doubled this year, right? It takes time, but he called that in the last cycle. Boom, done. Next Gold. Frank's company that has an asset that's buildable, but to your point, David, that has a team that can do it. That's critical. What is uh, your long-term vision here? Are you you mentioned we're, the project is going to be built? You use the word built. Are you planning to go into production? Yeah, in the in the in the future, in the next sixteen months, we're looking at putting shovels in the ground. We have a feasibility or final a bankable feasibility study coming out. But in months. sixteen months? That's not very long at all. In sixteen months, we're looking at putting shovels in the ground to start building. That's one part of our portfolio and one part of our strategy. The, the main goal for this company is to be a two to 500,000, sometimes four, I say, but five, because I want to start getting bigger, two to 500,000 ounce per year producer in the next five years. That means we're going to need to grow. That means we're going to need to build. That means we needed the right team to do it, which we do have. Again, this has been done by Frank over and over and over in cycles like this, where equities are very low compared to where the gold price is, and they will catch up. What's your strategy for raising capital? I'm assuming you'll need more capital as you get closer to the 16-month uh, production timeline here. We have 12 million in the bank right now. We'll be done our feasibility study Q1, Q2. We'll still have capital left. We're currently drilling 25,000 meters to show that these current resources can grow significantly. So as far as raising capital, we have not had a struggle to raise capital in the past. You know, people like Frank Justra. People like extract capital behind us and put significant dollars into this. You have a very clear path. I would say, watch how we get creative, watch how this company grows. And our goal is to be the most non-dilutive growth company out there. Let's talk about what's next immediately. So short-term and medium-term, what are the next developments that we as investors should be uh, paying attention to and watching out for? Like I said, m and is a part of our strategy. We want to be looking for assets that can do 80 to 120,000 ounces per year production potential, two to three million ounces of gold, permittable or permitted. Those are That's a key part. We're also drilling 25,000 meters. You're going to start seeing results from that into late October. Q1, our fee bankable feasibility study, First Nation agreements. Q3, we'll have our construction decision. So you're going to have a plethora of news flow coming out of this company in the short term, which means stay tuned. It's going to get exciting. Very good. Uh, where can we follow the company? www.nexgold.com. That's our website. Our ticker and the TSXV is NEXG. Okay. We'll put the uh, link down below. So make sure to follow uh, Morgan and the Next Gold team there. Congratulations on your success so far. We'll speak again soon and get more updates from you. Thanks a lot, David. Great being here. And thank you for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe.